James chapter 7 starts like this, and he says, Therefore, brothers, be patient. Let's just pause there. We're going to be here a while. <laughs> be patient. How many of you, this is a struggle? How many of you actually are thinking to yourself right now, I should have slept in? Or do we really have to start here today? Can't we work up to that word? Why does it have to be patience up front? Let's just build into it. Let's talk about, I don't know, endurance or stress or whatever, and then hit patience. Why do we have to start with patience? And I'm going to be honest with you, okay? I have more notes than usual. This is going to be a longer sermon than usual, but I figured it was appropriate. I'll teach you patience. <laughs> so, uh, so we're going <laughs> to... I can see three people appreciated that. Everyone else is like, no, that's not funny because you might be serious. And I just, no. And so where is it? When you think to yourself, where do you struggle with your patience? And for some people, their patient struggle is with their children. For some people, their, <laughs> some people, their patient struggle, I, I have that with my child sometimes. My, my daughter woke me up at two o'clock this morning. Okay, just this morning, uh, last night, this morning, yeah, it woke me up, woke my wife and I up. She comes into the room, it freaked us out, okay, because all of a sudden, we just, I open my eyes, and you have that feeling that someone's in the room staring at you, you know, and it's not just some horror movie. There's all of a sudden these, these little eyes, just for the light is sli slightly from the moon through the window glaring, and you just see this, like, raccoon scare, just, you know, it's like, what, what? And, I, and she goes, I have to use the bathroom you know how to use it. Go. My zipper's stuck. <laughs> you know, and it's like patience, patience. I'm preaching on patience. And so, and so sometimes it's our children. Sometimes it's coworkers. Sometimes it's customers. Sometimes it's our loved ones, the people we, you know, like not just children, but our spouses or our parents or our sisters and brothers, our siblings, okay? They're, they're, they just push our patience. For some people, it's their boss, right? They just come in and you're just like, man, I, I have the struggle with being patient. Their tone, their, their demands, their expectations, just patience, patience, okay? And for some people, it's a restaurant drive through It's a waiter or waitress. For others, it's technology. I've seen this one a lot. People are impatient with technology. I see people going, I, I'm trying to go online. I'm trying to, uh, it, my phone won't, uh, it, it's, it's so, I need to switch providers. I need a new phone. It, it's take, uh, and it's like, your signal's going to space and back. Give it a moment, you know? <laughs> but people are like, ah, they're impatient, right? And so there's technology frustrations with that. And we're, we're just, it's almost like we're a society who's impatient. It's just almost as if. It's like we want our speed limits increased. Do you ever see the highways lowered in speed limit? You know, that doesn't happen very often. It's not often you see a 70 mile an hour road and then the state goes, you know, let's go ahead and lower it to 55. No, what do they do? We had a highway, 131. It was 55 for a while. Then they moved it to 65. Now it's 70, and there's still rumblings. 75, okay. And part of me is like, well, it hurt the gas mileage, but I get to go faster. Yeah, let's do it. You know, and, and because we're, I know you're like, you're crazy. But it's it, patience. You know, I like, I like to go fast, okay? And I want it to be legal, but we're in patient. That's a, I don't know how many of you have seen a trailer of a movie on TV and you say the phrase, I can't wait to see that movie. You know, that's, that's where I'm at with several films. I'm just like, ah, oh, Avengers 2, man. Star Wars 7, all next year. Next year can't come fast enough. Okay, I'm just geeked. I wanted to see it all. And I'm just like, I just can't wait. You know, and, and we get this impatient drive. Okay, I'm waiting for this information from my seminary regarding my graduation, and I'm impatient. Ask my wife. I just want to, I'm just like, I want to send an email. I just want to find out the dates. I just want to know when. I just want to know. She's like, just be patient. I'm like, I am being patient. She goes, no, you're not. You're pacing a hole in the floor. I'm like, but I'm not ending an email. I'm not sending it, but I want to. And it's, it's that battle between that drive, that ambition, that anticipation, and yet we are out of control and we can't do anything about it and we have to wait for it and we get so, ugh. So this is what we're going to be talking about today. 
patience. <laughs> and it's just, it's going to be so much fun because James says, he's like, you got to be patient. And of course, what does patient even mean? And I have a tendency of thinking that we have misunderstood patience and that we have inappropriately defined it as to meaning to wait. And that is the not what patience means. That is the furthest from the definition, okay? That we tend to think it means to passively wait, that we just sit and we wait. And that is not patience. That is actually idleness. And the Bible's anti-idleness, but it's pro-patient. So what does patience even mean? So I thought I'd let you know what the Greek word actually means. So this is what it looks like. There's what patience is. Isn't that great? Isn't that pretty? The word is pronounced makrothumos. Okay, that's what it's pronounced, makrothumos. Basically, it means that you have a long thermometer. <laughs> okay, that's technically what the word means, is it means long thermometer. Uh, macro actually means big, right, or long, as opposed to mini. So macro, and then thumos, we get the word thermometer from it. So it means to have a big temperature, which doesn't make sense. So we say long thermometer. A technical definition of it, it literally means to have a spirit that is not easily offended and you can put up with others. Okay, that's the primary definition of patience. Macrothumos, having a spirit that is not easily offended and you're able to put up with others. Okay, so if you wanted to, if you wanted to keep with the P funness of this, you have patience, which does not mean passively waiting, but it does mean putting up with others. Huh? Huh? Isn't that fun? We're going to have a lot more, trust me, a lot more P's. Okay, so it, it's about putting up with others. But then the question may come, but for how long? How long must I put up with others? How long must I have this patience? And James knew you were going to ask that question. So he answers it for you. Second part of verse 7. He says, therefore, brothers, be patient until... Okay. <laughs> the Lord's coming. Okay, that's how long. Okay, so be patient until the second coming of the Lord. That's how long. It's for him and his readers, originally, he's writing around late, mid to late 50s A.D., that meant almost so far 2,000 years. And it could be yet another almost 2,000 years. But it, you be patient and you put up with others until Jesus returns, which makes sense. Because when Jesus returns, that's when everything, that's when justice reigns, that's when the new heavens and new earth end up getting made, that's where we get our sin nature removed and we get the resurrected bodies. And we won't have to put up with others because they won't be so sinfully annoying. <laughs> <laughs> so that makes sense. That basically what James says is you be patient. How long? Until you die. <laughs> okay? You got to be patient. It's, it's a lifelong battle all the way until the Lord returns. And it's interesting that, man, you know, God is slow to anger. That's his character. Okay? And it's the same word, macrothumos. God is patient. God is slow to anger. He is, has great long-suffering, and that's how we're supposed to be toward others. That's how God is toward us. That's how we're supposed to be toward others, is putting up with others, having this ability to endure with long-suffering, being slow to anger. Another way of looking at it would be not just long thermometer, but maybe a long fuse, that you might be a stick of dynamite, but your fuse is extra long. And your fuse is, a, is like a firework fuse, which just takes forever to get there anyway. Okay, I'll never forget when we had our, one of our Fourth of July parties, and, and uh, my brother-in-law and I, was, we were lighting fuses, and we had this time. We're going to light this fuse, and it's going to go from here across the parking lot and light the firework. And we're like, yeah, 20 minutes. Still working its way there. <laughs> we're like, this is the worst show ever. Because fuses sometimes are very slow to burn anyway. And so this idea of patience is that not only do you have a slow burning fuse, but it's also extra long. So that's this idea of patience that we have until Jesus returns or until what is also known as 
the parousia. Another P word. Okay, parousia. This it literally means the judgment of Christ, the second return of Christ, the full outpouring of his justice, the full outpouring of his judgment. So be patient, be long suffering. In other words, don't offer judgment upon people because one day Jesus will come with his judgment and judgment is his. So be patient until his judgment comes. So when we see this, how long until the coming of the Lord, it's literally don't judge, wait until Jesus comes and he will judge. Okay, so it has this parousia attitude to it. So we have patience. It is not passively waiting. It is putting up with others and it is preparing for the parousia. I told you we're getting more peas, and we got more to go. We're just at the beginning, <laughs> okay? And so it's this idea of that. And so what, what James does is he gives us an example of waiting for the parousia. He gives us an example through the eyes of a farmer, through the last part of verse 7 and into verse 8. He gives us an example of a farmer. So James writes this, and he says, see how the farmer waits for the, I know, you're going to say, ah, it says waiting right there. Ah, but not so fast. What is this farmer waiting for? Waits for the precious fruit of the earth and is patient with it until it receives the early and late rains. That's interesting. The, the fall and spring rains. This is interesting. The spring and fall rains. So the early and late rains. You also must be patient. Okay, you also must be patient. Strengthen your hearts because the Lord's coming is near. Okay, so strengthen your hearts because the Lord's coming is near. So he says, be patient until the Lord comes. Be patient, the Lord's coming is near. And the farmer is the illustration of that event. So this farmer example here is not that we just sit and wait and see if a crop blooms up out of the ground. The idea is, is eventually the rains will come. Eventually Jesus will pour out his justice. And the fruit of that will arise. Jesus will set the record straight. The judgment will indeed come. And what can happen is people can get weak hearted in that wait because they're suffering, because they're dealing with pains, because they're dealing with injustices, because they're dealing with illness and they're dealing with death. And they're wishing that God would intervene. And James is saying that ultimately God will not intervene until the Lord comes. There might be temporary interventions here and there. God might pour out grace a little bit here and there. And that you might find some people who are sick that might get well. And you will find some people who are dealing with sufferings. And sometimes it just miraculously goes away. But most of the time, it's not going to. Most of the times, you are out of control of, of some of that. And you're just going to have to deal with it until the Lord comes. And these people are, they're suffering and they can become weak hearted. That's why James says to what your hearts strengthen. Okay. You have to strengthen your, we're going to see how we can strengthen our hearts toward the end of today. Okay. We're going to, we're going to see some principles on that, but we got to get this foundation laid first. So we have to, we can become a weak hearted individual. Here's what I've noticed that what can happen is this, that as our stresses hit, as our sufferings grow, as our burdens are laid upon us, our patience begins to get weaker and our heart becomes weaker and we become in a state of despair. And if we're not careful, what can end up happening is that we end up making all of life about us we put ourselves in the center of life and we surround ourselves with people and all we do is just unload and complain and gripe and we just unload about all our problems and we say, oh, woe is me. And we point everything to ourselves and we ignore God out of the equation and our hearts can become so weakened that we end up having despair and we end up choosing a life of sin and we end up falling into old sinful habits as if we were never saved to begin with. Our lives can totally backslide and we can start making choices and we vindicate ourselves 
ourselves and we justify ourselves on those choices. And people warn us, you be careful, be careful. And we say, you just don't get it. You just don't get it. I'm having a hard time. And this is where I get my relief. This is where I get my help. And they're just sliding deeper into sin. And then they end up getting to the point where they say, God, why aren't you doing something? And God's like, you're going far away from me. You're getting weak hearted. I'm not doing anything because you're way over there and you need to come over here. And God's like, I'm ready for you. You just got to turn your life around and make better choices. And they're like, but I'm here and I just want you to intervene. God, you know what? I'm so despaired. I'm done with this. I'm so tired of life. I want you to come and just come back now. And we tend to find that when our life's at its darkest, we're all for the return of Jesus. We become all for it. And what that means, if Jesus were to return right now, is that means salvation's done. That means evangelism, done. Whoever's not saved is going to hell and, and it's over. And do we really, and that's supposed to be our focus, it's the Great Commission. We're supposed to be about helping people come to Christ. It's supposed to be about being agents of redemption. And once Jesus comes, that's it. We're, we're done with our task. And to be able to, to say, my pain is so great, I don't want anybody else getting saved, Jesus come now. You see the selfishness of that. But people get there and they get weak hearted. And they get unfocused and they get disoriented. And so they end up saying, Jesus, come now. And then sometimes when he doesn't come, some people even get so far into that realm of selfishness and so far into that hurt and so far into that despair that they say, fine, if Jesus isn't going to come to me, I'm going to go to him. And they choose a the route of suicide. Okay, and so that, that's where this begins to play out. And so what James is saying, he's like, strengthen your hearts. Jesus will be intervening at some point. He is going to be returning. It is near. The problem is, is that our timetable is not equal to God's timetable because we're impatient and he's not. And we say, wow, 2,000 years, that's not near at all. And God's like, that's 2,000 years of people getting saved. And if there's only 2,000 years left, or only 30 years left, or 400 years left, that means that salvation stops there. That means that you're talking who knows how many people after that are, are going to be for, permanently forever lost. Okay, so he's like, this, this, this is serious. It is near. It's nearer than what, than what we would really want to understand and appreciate because we're impatient. And so what James does then, he says that because God's judgment is coming, it is going to happen. Jesus is going to return. He says, strengthen your hearts. And then he says, here's how this is going to play out. Here are some instructions on how patience looks. Okay, so he gave the illustration of the farmer, not about passively waiting. Keep in mind, the, no farmer is passively idle. Even when they're waiting for the rain to come and to bring in the harvest, they're still, A, anticipating the harvest, and they're anticipating it with such activity that they prepare for it by building up storage rooms and getting the storage houses together, and they're constantly working, and they're tending, and they're making sure the fields are ready, and they're making sure that the seeds are sown. They're making sure that the plowing is done. They're making sure that everything is equipped for when that rain comes. They're busy. Farmers are some of the busiest people on the planet. Okay, so don't ever look at this saying the farmer waits and think that that means patience means we just sit down and wait. It's farthest from it. Patience is not passive, it is active. Patience is not just sitting down idle, it is pursuing. Okay, so patience has this anticipation, this longing about it. So James says, let's play this out. He says, let's play this out. You got the example of the farmer. Let's see how this looks in everyday life. And he gives a couple of examples. And they're the weirdest examples you could ever imagine. He gives the example here in verse 9. He says, brothers, do not complain about one another so that you will not be judged. Look, the judge stands at the door. This is serious. Because check this out. Do not complain. Do not grumble, depending on your translation about one another, so that you will not be, and the judge is right there, okay, so this is really, really serious, and I know it's, this is a weird example, because if you're like me, and you see this idea of don't grumble, don't complain, to me, that seems like a minor offense, mainly because I run across complaining, and sometimes even personally complain <laughs> quite often, okay, and my wife goes, <laughs> my wife is like, are you complaining, and I go, no, I'm just stating facts, but yeah, it's, <laughs> it's complaining, 
okay? And, and James is like, do not come complain about one another or you will fall under judgment. In other words, complaining, grumbling is equal to unbelief. And I know that seems, yeah, isn't that rough? But that's what it is. The person who complains is giving the attitude and behavior of somebody who has no belief in Christ. They are acting like an unbeliever when they complain. And, and it's like, really? Really? Why? What does patience even mean? Remember the definition? It means to put up with. And if you're complaining, what are you not doing? You're not putting up with others. Okay, that's what complaining is. Doing. Complaining is a form of judgment. I am judging this individual as being stupid, as being ignorant, as being wicked, as being whatever. And rather than talking to them one on one, like Matthew, like Jesus taught Matthew to do, if anyone sins against you, if you have any problems with anyone, or they transgress, you're supposed to meet to them one on one. And if there is no restoration, if the conflict cannot be resolved, then you go and you bring a couple of other people in to help restore them to repentance. Okay, even Paul in Galatians chapter 6 says, if anyone's caught in any type of sin or trespass, gently restore such a one, O you who are spiritual. Okay, so there's all this direction of you go to that person, you don't talk about that person to everyone else in the form of a judgment. Complaining, grudging. Okay, grumbling not grudging, holding grudges is part of that issue. This is not a new teaching, by the way. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18 says, do not hold grudges against anyone. Do not hold grudges against anyone. Same type of teaching. Do not grumble. Do not complain. Okay, and when someone says, hey, friends, I got to complain. I got all these problems. I'm just going to gripe out, and this person did this, and this person did that. What they're doing is they're paying judge and all the friends they're complaining to has just become the jury, and they're hoping that they stay guilty just like they want as a ruling. And who does judgment belong to? Christ. And his coming is near. If there really was an injustice, and you go to that person, and they're unwilling to repent, and you get a couple of witnesses, and you go back to that person, and they're unwilling to repent, and you do everything you can biblically to handle the issue, ultimately the judgment falls upon Christ. And until then, let him deal with that. You continue pursuing life. You continue working. You continue doing what you're supposed to be doing, being faithful to Christ. And let the judgment of that wrongdoing be something that Jesus will take care of. And by the way, Jesus' judgment is far more creative than anything you would ever come up with. Just pointing that out. <laughs> okay, so it's, ah, uh, so grudging, complaining. This is where they, this is where James starts. He says, don't grumble. Don't hold grudges. Don't complain. Don't get all around grumpy. <laughs> okay? Don't go there. And so he says, as an example, he says, you know what? Here's an example. Look at the prophets and look to Job. I'm serious. He actually mentions, he actually calls Job out on the floor on this, which is weird. Check this out. He says, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the Lord's name as an example of suffering and patience. Take the prophets as an example of suffering and patience. See, we count as blessed those who have endured. You have heard of Job's endurance or Job's patience, depending on your translation, and have seen the outcome from the Lord. The Lord is very compassionate and merciful. I find this hyper odd. I'm just being honest with you. I find this hyper odd because number one, he doesn't mention any of the prophets, which means he takes them as a whole. And who he does mention is Job. And if you've ever read that book, that is a book mostly filled with Job complaining about the injustices that he's suffering. <laughs> so here is James saying, hey, don't complain. Be like Job who spent the whole book complaining. <laughs> it just seems weird, doesn't it? Okay, so I, I, I run, I'm reading this, I'm running across this, I'm scratching my head going, James, James, what a weird example. Job, really? And I just wanted to go, that's a bad example. But before I said that, I had to remind myself, James is writing scripture. The Holy Spirit is enclothing James. And James is writing through the inspiration of the Spirit so that everything he writes is the inspired and complete word of God. So that means this is the example God wanted to have used. So there's something happening here 
that we are sometimes possibly missing when it comes to the prophets and it comes to Job. Here's what the prophets were like. The prophets went around and they preached the message of God. Okay, They went and they proclaimed and they preached. They were the mouthpiece of God. And they were that intercessor between God and the people and the people to God. Okay, that's how the, the prophet often functioned. And the prophets were hated. And the prophets were beaten, were abused, were killed. In fact, the book of Hebrews gives a long description of what happened with the prophets as a whole. That they were stoned, they were sawed in half, they were beheaded, they were killed, they were and all these descriptions. And then it said that these prophets were people of whom the world was not worthy. <laughs> no lie. Okay, and so the prophets were hated. People did not like them because the prophets usually showed up when people were living in sin. And the prophets would say, hey, by the way, that is displeasing to God. Do this instead. And then the people say, no, I, I like what I'm doing. Don't you tell me this is sin. I don't like you. And there even one king ended up saying, uh, I have this prophet, but he's in my dungeon. Why is he in the dungeon? Because he says things about me that I don't like. <laughs> Duh. That's what prophets do, okay? They, they were proclaiming the word of God. If everything was going great, God wouldn't need to send a prophet because you're doing things great. So the prophet's there to say, red flag, red flag, the road you're on is, is destruction. And so people didn't like the prophets, yet the prophets spoke. Yet the prophets spoke all the way to their death. They persevered. There's another P word. Now let's look at the life of Job. Here's a guy that ended up having great wealth and a great family, and he was so godly that he would actually pray that God would forgive his sons just in case they might have sinned last night at a party. I don't know how many parents say, God, I don't know if my kids might have sinned last night, but just forgive them and put grace upon them. I don't know how many people pray like that about their kids. Most of the time, people just say, God, my kids are annoying. Could you please change them for me? They don't have the compassion to say, God, would you forgive them? Okay? And so that's how Job was. Godly man, godly man. Not perfect, not perfect. He should be observed, not admired. But he was a godly man. And eventually, through uh, God and Satan's conversations and challenges and for weird scenarios, Job lost everything. His children were all killed. All his fields were burned. All his animals died. And all he had left was uh, his bickering wife, a woman who said, hey, Job, go ahead and just curse God and die. And Job's like, that's a great idea. Thank you for that, old ancestor of Barnabas. That is such an encouragement. I'll just put that on my list. Curse God and die. Why didn't I think of that? Okay, that's how much of encouragement she was. And then he got sick and had boils to the point of having taken pottery, breaking it and taking shards of it and scratching himself because he just couldn't dig with his nails deep and hard enough. Okay, and then there he is in this horrible state and his friends show up and they say, hey, Job, um, obviously you're having sin in your life and God's punishing you because you have all this horrible stuff happening to you. Therefore, God's punishing you, which is really an encouragement because that's like going up to someone who's in a car accident and they're laying on the ground with possibly broken legs, going up to them saying, oh my gosh, what, what did you do? And what do you mean, what did I do? Well, you were in this car wreck. Obviously, you must have sinned. What did you do? You know, it's just, that's just so encouraging. And uh, <laughs> I mean that sarcastically. Okay, but they're, so they're there, they're yelling at Job, and they're saying, Job, what did you do? What did you do? You must have sin. You need to repent. And Job ends up saying, I am being unjustly punished. I, I, am, I am, God is unfairly, I would love to go to a courtroom. I would love for God to show up and explain to me what's going on here. Because I have not, I can't think of anything. I'm not a perfect man, but I can't think of anything I could have done to have warranted this. And they're like, well, maybe you didn't give to the poor. Maybe you didn't help somebody in need. Maybe, and Job's like, I have done all of that. I can't think of any reason. I am unjustly being punished here. I am unjustly suffering. And I wish God would just come down here. It's as if he has a target on my face and he has a bow and arrow and he's just laying into me over and over and over again. It's as if I, I am just, it's unjust. It is totally unjust. And what is noticing of this is that Job perseveres in that, A, he never gave in to his friends' his error, and B, he never turned his back on God. He complained, 
He griped. At one point, he even cursed the day of his birth and said, I wish I had been stillborn. I wish my day, the day I was born, may that day be cursed. So Job did have sin. He did respond inappropriately. But what James is wanting us to notice is that he persevered through the suffering. Job clung unyieldingly to God as the context of his life. That's what Job did. Job's answer was, this is injustice, and I want God to explain to me. Not, I hate God. Not, I curse God. Not, I might as well go to the bar every week and drink with losers. Not, I'd rather go out gambling. Not, I'd rather go and just dig myself deep into porn. Not, I'd rather go and find people to sleep with and fill my life with emptiness, meaningless sex. Not, I would rather. He does not go into the life of sin like that. God stays the context of his life. God stays the motivation for his existence. God stays the very central point of why he breathes. And he wants to know why God has not intervened, not I hate you, God, for not intervening. He just would love an answer. And what's amazing is God never gives it to him. And he's okay with that. God never tells him why. It wouldn't have helped. It wouldn't have helped. God does not tell him why. God does not give, God doesn't even say thank you for enduring. God does not give any of that. What God does do is he shows up and he yells at Job and he yells at Job's friends. He goes to Job's friends and says, hey, Job is right. He's been unjustly suffering. Then he goes to Job and he says, you know what? You've been griping and complaining, thinking that I owe you an answer. And do you know who I am? I am God, and I made the heavens of the earth. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Don't you question me. You just need to trust me. I am a good God. I am a merciful and compassionate God. You wanted me to show up? Here I am. Trust me. Trust me. And that was good enough for Job. And that's what James wants the people of the church to have. That type of perseverance that type of perseverance to say, I am not going to give up on my faith because life is so hard, because suffering is happening, because it is unjust, because there's no answers, and it's not letting up. Change does not want us to give up on our faith, but to persevere, to persevere. And then he gives one more example, one more example of, of patience, And that is, do not make oaths, do not make vows. (laughs) Again, what on earth does this have to do with anything? It's a head scratcher, it really is. Check this out, here's what he says in verse 12. James writes, now above all, my brothers, you love that, now above all, or therefore could also be, but it's this really concluding statement. He's like, let's just be wrapped up with this issue. Do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath. Let your yes be yes, or your yes must be yes, period. And your no must be no, period, so that you will not fall under judgment, which means making oaths like this is equal to unbelief, is a sign of unbelief. And this is rough. This is rough, because if it was a sign of faith, you wouldn't be under judgment. So somehow this is connected to the issue of unbelief. And if you ever want to see an, un, a, 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 an oath issue in scripture, we won't cover it today, but just for reading in your own Bible time, read Judges chapter 11, a guy by the name of Jephthah, and see how sometimes making an oath can really destroy your life. See the, but James doesn't mention Jephthah like he does Job or anyone else, so we're not going to quite go there. I do want to point out exactly what is going on here. Why are old such a problem that we can be fall under judgment? And here's what's going on. Usually, when people make an oath and they say, I swear in the name of God, or I swear by heaven, or I swear on my mother's grave, or I swear on whatever people swear on, That's why he said, don't swear by things of earth, things of heaven, just don't do this. But usually when people say, I swear, what they're doing is, 
number one, they're tending to use the swearing as a bargaining chip, usually against God. Okay, they're wanting to do like a bargaining chip with God. Other times that people are doing this is because that their word is so untrustworthy that they're trying to add weight to their promise to make people think that they're serious this time. So they're trying to add something to it to give their words more weight, to compensate the suspicion of being untrustworthy. And what James is basically saying is if you are a person of faith, you will not need to add weight to your words because your yes will be good enough. Your no will be good enough. You will not need to make oaths and you will not need to make swearings on whatever because your word is integrity. Your word has integrity to it. So you do not need to give your words weight and you do not need to make oaths to try to manipulate God to hasten your alleviance of suffering which is how people use it, the bargaining chip against God or bargaining chip with God. It's God, I will give you this oath if you just alleviate this suffering now. If you would just do this for me, I will forever do this. And James says, where's the patience in that? Where's the patience in that hastening of that issue? What if God wants you to do what you're promising you will do, but he does not want to stop the suffering? because there's a purpose to it. Does that mean you're not gonna do the good obedience that you should probably be doing in the first place? You know, and maybe the suffering will eventually go away in its appropriate time and does not need an intervention. Things will be fine. And so James is saying, you know, you need to be patiently, prayerfully seeking the Lord. Don't need to bargain. You don't need to alleviate anything and keep your promises because God always keeps his. And we need to be an example of God in that way. So this is James' discussion on patience. He says, basically, patience is not passively waiting. It is putting up with others as we are uh, pursuing or are preparing for the perusia, the coming of the Lord, and therefore must persevere in our faith and in our waiting, and in our patience. But how do we strengthen our hearts to be able to do that? How do we go about actually growing our patience? Of which I would like, based on the text here and based on several readings, I would love to offer you a couple of insights. Just, just three short ones here for you. And then we'll be done, so be patient. The first one, and I, and I like this, is called get a relief valve. Get a relief valve. I think they're also called a, a, a T, P, I don't remember the name of it now, but a relief valve nonetheless. Somewhere in your house, somewhere in your dorm, somewhere in your apartment, there is one of these puppies. It's a water heater. And on this water heater, what it does is it builds up with pressure and it cooks the water so that it becomes warm and we can have nice warm water to wash our hands and scalding hot water to shower with. At least that's how I like mine. <laughs> okay, and so that's this, 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 it's this water heater. No, it's not a hot water heater. You don't need to heat hot water. <laughs> it's a water heater, okay? <laughs> Get our terms right here. <laughs> So it's our water heater. And on the water heater is this nice little dilly-dally called a relief valve. Oh, temperature pressure. There it is. Thank you. So TPR valve. That's what it is. Temperature pressure relief valve. Okay. So TPR valve. I knew I was getting closer with the TP. I just got my mind with the toilet paper and I was done. <laughs> I went TP. I haven't TP'd in a long time. <laughs> and I, I, Oh, yeah. Water heater. So I was done. So yeah, the TPR valve, but yeah, the relief valve. And what, what this does is if some, you want to make sure this is working, by the way, because this allows pressure to release if there's a problem, okay? And now they got multiple ways, there's, there's, there's other things that help if this isn't working that your water heater is still safe, but nonetheless, if this is all you had was this valve, and if this valve was not working, your water heater no longer becomes a water heater. It becomes a former water heater. 
and is now something for EOD to take care of. <laughs> Explosives, you know, it becomes a bomb type of a deal. You, you want this to be working because if the pressure gets inappropriate, it lets the pressure out so that it doesn't go. Okay, and what we need in life are relief valves. We need something to be able to help take some of the pressure off. And it depends on what your job is, what your life is like, what this would actually play out to be like. For people like, like me, I have a very mental job, being a pastor, and I'm a professor at two different schools, so I have a very mental job. And even at the, at the bus station, it's kind of nice sometimes because it's a little physical, but it's still a lot of mental going on there. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I have a very mental job. That means that for my relief valve, it's going to have to be something physical that will usually involve my hands or something. And so, like, for example, I found out that I found a great relief valve last winter because we had a, we had a horrible winter last winter. A lot of ice, a lot of ice. And we had at the foot of our driveway this big old, like, couple foot thick thing of ice. So I went out there with a big old long-handled axe, and I found great relief in life swinging that axe onto that ice. I mean, that was a great relief valve. I have no idea why. But it was just going, <laughs> I mean, it was great relief from my pressures in life. Again, I have no idea why. Um, <laughs> But whatever it is in your life, uh, other relief valves that I have it is playing catch. I love putting on a baseball glove, grabbing a baseball, and, and throwing the ball around. And, and I'm glad that my wife is, is a tomboy, uh, that, that she, she knows how to throw a ball. She doesn't do this, okay? She knows how to actually put some pepper on it to where I have to actually, you know, get it. And you can hear it go, you know? I'm like, yeah, baby, give daddy some pepper, you know? And we just have a good time. And I love throwing the ball around. I, I, it, those, I love wrestling with my kids. Sometimes if I'm really, really just stressing, and I know that my patience is, going to, is starting to wear thin, and I just need a little bit of, of a relief, I know I can go to my kids, and I can just go up to George and go, nah, and he'll go, ha, 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 and he'll fall to the ground, funniest thing. Okay, for some reason, me going, ha, ah, makes him just, just collapse, and he laughs all the way down, and it's a lot of fun. I know that I could go up to Ziva and go, and she'll go, ah, ah, and take off running, and, and if I don't run fast enough, she'll stop and go, Daddy, I'm over here, <laughs> yeah, and, and I, can, I can run around with my kids and wrestle with them. I know that at any point, I can go up to my wife and just grab her by the wrist and go on and just lift her up off of her feet, and then she'll just put her fingers right in my ribs, and down I go, and we just have a good old WWE match. And so there are things you can do <laughs> that are a relief, okay, that just helps you make it through. And I would love for you to take time to look through your life and ask yourself, what are your relief valves? If you have a very physical job, it might be something that's not as physical, like, like sitting down and reading a book. It might be something like going out and working in the garden, it, it, depending on, on how, you, how you are and what you got going on, but something that's your relief valve. So step one, I would just advise, get a relief valve, okay? Second thing I would advise you to do is to get within your life a lightning rod, Okay? <laughs> You'd be like, what? <laughs> a lightning rod. You know, those little metal things that stick on the top of houses or barns or buildings or skyscrapers. And what it does is that it grabs the lightning bolt and it grounds it to where it doesn't harm the unit itself. Okay, the, the house is safe because the lightning will hit the rod. And what it essentially does is it filters out all the negative energy from the storm. And when we have storms in our lives, a lot of times we get surrounded with and even contribute to the negative energy that's there, all the negativity. And we just want to spiral in it and sit on it for a while. And a lightning rod helps you to ground that out. By the way, the Lord is a great lightning rod. When Jesus was stressed out, when he was looking at the cross and he was going to be unjustly killed, what did he do? His lightning rod consisted of two, two people, really, one was a group, his friends, that he had come pray with him, and God the Father. And he did not spend the time with God the Father complaining in the form of a prayer. 
He spent the time saying, God, what is your will here? What is this going to look like? And had God help filter out the negative charge of the storm so that Jesus can endure. And we need lightning rods in our lives that we can surround ourselves with people and we can all together beseech God. Not surround ourselves with people so we can complain and gripe and moan, but we can surround ourselves with people that we can all seek God's will together. And in so doing, getting a lightning rod that helps us with that charge, that negative charge that can destroy us if we're not careful. Then the last one is embrace, don't resist, don't reject, don't ignore, but instead embrace the seasons of life. This will be directly from the farmer example. Embrace the seasons of life. Here's what I've noticed from life. Life has seasons, and they don't just last months. Sometimes the seasons are short, and they last days. Sometimes the seasons are long, and one particular season lasts a year or more. I do know that life is like a season, that we have those springs where things in life feels fresh, and there seems to just be a lot of of newness. Then there's summer, where we have a lot of growth is happening. And a lot of activity is going on. Then there's fall, some, maybe some pretty things, but you notice that things are starting to dwindle. Things aren't as warm as they used to be. Winter, where you can't see that there's life beneath the snow and everything seems dead and cold and empty. And we're just longing for summer again. And some people within storms or within tornadoes or hurricanes of life are saying, man, I wish it were cooler. I look forward to winter. And what happens is a lot of times, whatever season we're in, we're longing for a different season. And we spend so much of our time longing for a different season that we don't get to really embrace the season that we're in. And here's what this ends up looking like. Let me just kind of give you a different analogy. It's like a book, okay? That life can also be like a book that what happens is, is you're turning a page to a different chapter, okay? And so now we might not be like this kitty cat and reading military strategy, but you get the idea that life can be like, like this book. And what happens is, is we turn to a new chapter in life. It's like a new season, but maybe for some of you, a book is a better analogy, that the page will turn and we're on a new chapter. Let me just give some illustrations for you. My son is one years old, one year old. <laughs> Funny how that can be plural. <laughs> My son's a year old, and it is cute when he grabs a chip with his little hands and he shoves it in his mouth, or he grabs a cracker and, or a, uh, a little crunchy, and he just grabs it and goes, <clears throat> and we're like, oh, look, he's eating, he's feeding himself. Isn't that cute? No one finds it cute when I do that. <laughs> okay, no one finds it cute. No one goes, oh, look, John's eating a cracker. <laughs> okay, no one finds that cute. I am beyond that season of my life where eating is cute. <laughs> okay, I am beyond that season. That page has turned. I am in a different chapter now. Now, I can either complain, gripe, mope, be, get all depressed, sit in a chair idle and go, oh, woe is me. I'm not in that chapter anymore. Or I can embrace that it's not cute when I eat, but I can enjoy that George is in that chapter. And I can appreciate him being there. Okay, that, that's what I mean by embracing the season. We're suffering now, but there are ways to embrace the present in such a way that we can appreciate our life and what's going on around us and what God is doing within it. One philosopher uh, named Blaise Pascal made this statement. He, He said, many of us live in the past, reflecting on the season that we have already been through, either regretting the things that we have that we have done or should have done, reminiscing about the things we shouldn't have done, or we live in the future, planning, anticipating, expecting that someday things will be good and I will be happy and I will have a good time. But if we live in the past or we live in the future, we never live because we miss the present. 
We never live because we miss the present. And there is a um, movie called Shadowlands with Anthony Hopkins. And Anthony Hopkins plays C.S. Lewis in that movie. And the movie goes through the death of his wife. And when his wife, they know that she's going to die. She has like maybe a month left to live at best. They know that, that it's coming near to the end. And he's like, let's just go out on a date while you still are able to walk. So they go out on a date and they walk around the, the park. And she says, when I die. And he says, no, 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 let's not talk about that. Let's just for this moment pretend like you're not sick. Let's just enjoy this moment as it is. And she tells him, no, let's not make this a fake moment. Let's not spend our time trying to pretend like this isn't our reality. Otherwise, we're not going to really enjoy this moment. Let's talk about this. Let's get this out in the open and enjoy where we are at the same time. Another way of looking at this would be uh, the other day I was with my daughter and she loves it when I juggle. She just loves it. My son loves it too. He, he, he just smiles. And, but he was taking a nap. Rachel was gone. I think she was at a store or at a um, party with bridesmaids or something. I don't remember exactly what. But so I, I'm juggling, and Z was just watching, and she's just amazed. I, I got, you know, three things I'm juggling. And I, I love this season of her life where she's so easily impressed. <laughs> you know, I, I just, I love this season. <laughs> and so I'm like, I'm juggling, and she's like, oh. <gasps> You know, and then I, I, and then eventually I threw them in such a way that two of the blocks collided and they shot off. And, and I went like that. And she laughed. Okay, and I'm talking a deep belly laugh. That, <laughs> you know, not, not that fake laugh or that throat laugh that some kids do from time to time. But I'm talking the deep, guttural, I'm almost delirious, I'm so tired type laugh. Okay, and so she's just laughing. And she gets up. She was sitting in Indian house. She gets up and she's laughing so hard she can barely stand up straight. And she picks up one block, picks up another block, comes up to me, and she, she gives them to me. And she sits down, crosses her legs, and goes, do it again, Daddy, do it again. So I, I start juggling. And she's like, no, Daddy, make them, make them hit again. Drop them again. <laughs> again, so easily impressed. I can fail, and she loves it. You know, so I, I juggle and I throw them in a way that they hit and they go. And she laughs. <laughs> she loves it. She gets up and she's half drunk still and she's laughing. She picks them up, picks them up, and she sits there and she's holding them. And you can tell what a child is thinking. And, and she's getting ready to do the same thing, right? So she, she's getting ready to throw it. She wants to try to juggle. And I'm just like, okay, yeah, go for it, baby. You just got to throw them in the air. So she goes like this. Whew. And she does not throw like a girl, you know. She, boom, full shoulder went at my head. <laughs> she was, you know, Bible here, about like that. Wham! I hit the deck. I screamed. I went, ah, boom! Oh, that was funny. <laughs> oh, she loved that. She wanted to repeat that game now. Let's see what else we can throw at daddy's head that is funny. She goes over and picks up her chair. She goes, daddy, let's use this. And she goes, I'm like, no. And no matter how loud I scream, it's just funnier. Now, someday, someday, my daughter is going to be going to school. She wants to go to school already so bad she can taste it. She's going to be going to school very soon, next year. Someday, she's going to be eventually going to school so much, meeting friends, that she's going to, I'm not going to see her as much. She's going to be involved in homework. She's going to be involved in school activities, going to class, coming home, having friends come over, going to friends' house. Someday, she's going to be growing up, going to high school, getting a license and driving. Someday, she's going to meet some guy and get married and move out. Someday, so much is going to happen that I'm going to be in a whole different place with her. And here's the thing. I can, again, sit in a chair and mope and get all depressed and say, someday my daughter is going to be going away. Someday she's going to grow up and be out of the house. Someday she's going to be. And I could get all idle and depressed and wonder what's the point and, and just get all mopey about it and grumble and complain lose faith, or 
I can embrace the season that we're in. Or I can say, I am going to be at this moment with her now and love every moment of it. And when she starts dating, I will love that moment. I will embrace it. That is, that is what we should be doing. It's not saying, oh, I remember when, I wish, I wish you could just be, I remember, I wish it could always be. It's embracing that moment. Rather than wishing what could have been could be again, rather than being afraid of what might be, to embrace that moment. And if we can do that, I believe our hearts will grow stronger and our patience will grow with it. Because we will not spend so much time regretting what was and fearing of what is that we will be able to patiently enjoy what is in this present. Anticipating, knowing that one day those rains will come and we'll get those crops and we'll get those things. Until then, we're going to be here working on this moment in this chapter. So as we look at patience, it is, you can tell from all these examples, none of this is passive. None of this is about sitting down and waiting. It is about getting that relief valve. It is about getting that lightning rod. It is about being through the seasons of life and embracing that. It is about having patience that puts up with others, anticipates and prepares for the parousia, and perseveres in Christ through the seasons of life. That's patience. That is what James is calling out for the people of the church to be like. Let's have a word of prayer.